Enrique Simonet's Flevit Super Ilam depicts the biblical story of Christ standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem and grieving for the city. Intimate and moving, the composition invites us to join Jesus' followers on the mountaintop and listen as he laments. Christ's grief is prompted by the disbelief of the Jewish leaders and God's judgment on Jerusalem. Beyond the religious implications of the painting, I will be exploring how images online can differ from each other and how these small changes can alter how we read a work. Enrique Simonet was a Spanish painter who worked from the end of the 18th century into the early 19th. A deeply religious man, he was recognized during his life with multiple international awards for the painting that we're going to explore today. I will link below to a video from the Prado Museum which did an extensive restoration of this massive painting and documented the process. Simonet was awarded a grant to study art in Rome, and during his time there, he decided to journey to Palestine to sketch landscapes, buildings, and people. His desire was to paint religious works that accurately portrayed the area. While there, the idea for this work formed, and after finishing the preparatory sketches, he headed back to Rome to finish the painting. Part of that study grant involved periodically providing paintings that demonstrated his progress. This work was sent during his fourth year of studies and won a first class medal at the International Fine Arts Exhibition in Madrid in 1892. The work continued on an international trip to enter and win additional contests in Barcelona, Chicago, and Paris. Shipping the work to all of these cities presented some logistical challenges. Flevit Super Alum is 10 feet by 18 feet, a monumental work. Viewing any painting on a computer screen presents challenges, and one of those is that it's hard to judge size, and size makes a difference. A work as massive as this one, when viewed in person, holds gravitas. The size leaves an impression on the viewer, which is why historical and religious works of art are often immense. They're meant to inspire and to create a sense of awe. This work does that. With the figures life-sized on a mountaintop, it's easy to imagine ourselves into the painting, gazing down on the temple in Jerusalem with Jesus, which is exactly what Simonet intended. He's even left a space for us to stand in, right next to Christ. The composition and the size invite the viewer to enter into the imagination of the artist into this moment of Christ's life. While the size adds to the overall impression of the work, it also presented challenges for a canvas that was going to be shipped multiple times. Normally, a canvas is stretched over bars to hold it securely, but Simonette wanted to be able to roll the work up for shipping. So instead, he opted to hang the canvas while he painted and then to ship it without a stretcher or a frame. The material used for this painting was a new seamless canvas that allowed the artist to work on just these immense works without necessitating a seam, like the one that we've seen in Tintoretto's Nativity, which the seam had to be made into a crossbeam to hide it in the work. When the painting was restored by the Prado, one of the things they noted was all the drips on the bottom. It's obvious that the painter was unconcerned about that area of the canvas as eventually it would be folded around a stretcher and then hidden by a frame. But without a stretcher holding the canvas taut, the paint was bound to hit the bottom edge, a reminder of this work's history. One reason many paintings need to be restored is the darkening of the varnish. And this was true of Then He Wept as well. As the play of light is a key element of this work, getting off that old varnish allows a fresh appreciation of the soft light of the sky as it illuminates the temple. A unique aspect of this work is that Simonet varied the way he applied the paint. The sky's luminosity is due to Simonet diluting the paint down so that it is translucent. In some areas of the sky, the paint is so thin you can see the prepped canvas beneath. This technique stands in contrast to the area filled with rocks, where Simonet has used impasto. Impasto is when an artist applies paint so thickly, the surface of the work has a texture to it. Some artists even used a palette knife instead of a brush to layer up the paint. In person, one can see the impasto areas throughout the painting. Before we dive deeper, let's clarify a bit about the story we are viewing. Christ and his disciples are approaching Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. 
and this begins the Passion Week, or the week that leads up to Christ's crucifixion. Christ has paused on the Mount of Olives and is gazing across the valley at Jerusalem and is moved to tears. Unlike his disciples, who can't imagine the horror of what is to come, Jesus knows that Jerusalem's destruction is not far off. The Gospel of Luke says this, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. In 70 CE, Rome will destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and slaughter the people. Later Christian accounts will attribute the destruction of the temple to God's judgment for rejecting his son, Christ, whose mission was salvation, not destruction. Several years back, I did a video on this work for a Lent devotional, and in my explanation of the painting, I used some of the information from the Prado Museum videos, which I'll link below. After the video was up on YouTube, I was contacted by the artist's great-grandson, who disputed some of the information I'd used. He graciously sent me an article and a different copy of the painting, which gave a different interpretation of some key elements of the work. In this sun versus moon question, I'm now leaning toward the moon, but I'm going to give you both interpretations and you can decide for yourself. The Prado video says that we're looking at a sunrise. The sun emerging on the horizon with the morning star shining above Christ's head gives us a beautiful soft sky that sheds light over the temple. Simonette wanted to highlight the temple and illuminating that portion of the painting with the soft light of a new dawn is gorgeous. This rising of the sun highlights the spiritual story that Simonette is telling. The world is in darkness, but a new dawn is coming. The Gospel of Matthew says, The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, to them light has dawned. So while Christ enters Jerusalem to begin his walk to the cross, the sun is rising on the horizon, foreshadowing his resurrection. The problem with the sun is that when standing on the Mount of Olives facing Jerusalem, we're facing west, the sun would rise in the east, behind us. Additionally, the common explanation is that the star in the sky over Christ's head is the morning star, or Venus. However, Venus cannot be in the western sky as the sun rises. Mercury and Venus are always seen to the east before sunrise and in the west at sunset. Because of this, Venus is the morning star when seen at sunrise and the evening star when seen at sunset. The desire to interpret the star above Christ's head as the morning star is because that is a name associated with Christ. Jesus being referred to as the morning star is about hope. Hope that after the world has been held in darkness and sin, Christ is bringing an eternal morning of promise and hope. Additionally, it's been noted that since Venus is not actually a star but a planet, there's no flickering to the light of Venus, just as there's no shifting or variability in Christ. So, how do we reconcile these astronomy details with the painting? We know that Simonet was interested in portraying an accurate picture of the scene, that he traveled to Palestine for just that purpose. He stood on the Mount of Olives to discover the perfect time of day to portray in his painting, a time that would illuminate the area where the temple had once stood. Artistic license is the answer. Simonet studied the area and the landscape, and then he altered what he wanted to, to make the statement he wished to make. Artists frequently make such choices. But did Simonette? When I received that email for Simonette's great-grandson, he told me this was not a sunrise so much as a setting moon. An interesting thought, given the fact that Jesus is arriving in Jerusalem for Passover. If you or any of your friends observe Passover, you will know that the date is quite variable. This is because the Jews used a lunar calendar, or one based on the moon, to determine when Passover falls. If the moon is just starting to dip below the horizon, and the sun is just starting to rise behind us, this would explain the diffuse soft light. I assume you've all been out during a full moon. The lighting is favored for its romantic appeal. It's illuminating, yet soft. And if you have experienced a glorious sunrise when the first rays of the sun break the horizon, it's easy to imagine 
that Simonet has painted a combination of both of those events, the sun rising behind us and a full moon hung low in the sky. This explanation, which is scientifically rational and consistent with the colors and use of light in the work, is a good one. Additionally, Venus is not the only planet that can appear in the morning sky and appear to be a star. Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars are all bright planets that could make an appearance where Venus could not. I'm going to link below to an article by a professor of astronomy that details this. So what do you think? Did the artist take artistic license or did he paint a scientifically accurate picture of the scene? Given the lengths Simonet went to to be accurate with other details, I'm going to lean toward the former. Now I mentioned above when I was discussing the size of the painting that it can be difficult to appreciate the original from a digital image. There are so many ways that we can be deceived by the computer or a photograph. I had originally been looking at a copy that was quite pink in the sky, which added to the feeling that I was looking at the sun. In the email I received from Simonet's family member, he sent a different link saying the actual painting colors were different. In that image, the tones are in the blue spectrum, which made me lean toward thinking that I was looking at the moon. Then, just to add more confusion, the picture at the top of the Prado Museum's entry, which I'm assuming they took after the restoration, is different still. In that image, there are more creams and browns, and the palette is a bit more neutral. Now, I've never seen the work in person, so I'm at the mercy of the images I can obtain online. So here they are. What do you think? As we move on, we notice that people are coming up the mountain to join Jesus at the top. Jesus is standing, his hands raised in a pose that is often a blessing. Here, perhaps, a prayer. He is wearing dark blue robes, the color generally associated with his divinity, and his disciples gather around him, and in the center there is a blank space. When an artist composes his or her canvas, they consider carefully where they will place things so that the end result achieves their objectives. They might want the work to shake us up, and so it's unbalanced and jarring. Or they might want us to just be observers, as if we're in a theater. Sometimes they place us far above the action so that we have a bird's eye view. Or they can force us to look up, placing the work above us, both physically and emotionally. Simonette wants to portray Jesus in a very human moment, one where he is grieving. The artist is inviting us to join Christ on the mountaintop. Frequently, artists will use the device of turning a figure's back to the viewer. That is a signal that we should take that person's vantage point as we engage with the work. We have one disciple in particular in that bright white robe with his back to us. Next to him is an open space, a space large enough for us to come along and stand there, observe Christ, and gaze out over the stunning view of Jerusalem and the temple. Perhaps we, like many of the people coming up the hill, will wear a concerned expression. These followers of Christ are concerned because Christ is weeping. What does it mean? What does he know that we don't know? Now in the far left of the painting, we have a third group of people still approaching, but a bit further off in the distance. When we focus on them, we can see that they're carrying palm branches and leading a donkey. Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem on what will come to be known as Palm Sunday. In the Gospel accounts, the events that have occurred just before this moment was Jesus sending disciples to borrow a donkey. And here they are, returning with the donkey and carrying palm branches. Soon Jesus will enter Jerusalem to cheers and waving branches and a moment of triumph before the horrors of Passion Week unfold. There is some debate, but many feel Simonet has included a skull in the rocks at the bottom left corner of the painting. Skulls are common in religious works, meant to convey that life is transient, and in this instance, Christ is moving toward his death. Right next to that skull is a rock where the artist has signed the work, but more than that, he has also written in Jerusalem, Rome, and the year. He seemed to want to commemorate the fact that he conceived of the work in Jerusalem, painted it in Rome, and he was 26 years old at the time. Simonet's great painting of that moment on the Mount of Olives gives us insight into a man who is filled with compassion for a city that will soon shout for his death. 
More than observers, we are invited to insert ourselves onto that mountaintop to stand with Christ as he looks over Jerusalem. I hope you've enjoyed this work as much as I do. We are used to the religious paintings of the Renaissance and the Baroque eras, but I find this portrayal so moving. It's got a quiet dignity that invites contemplation. If you would like to view more works focused on Christ's Passion Week, I'll link to a playlist below. Also, here's the article below that explains the astronomy involved and a link to the Prado's restoration video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video by giving us a thumbs up below and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss great commentary on classic works of art. KellyBagdanoff.com is your source for great content and curriculum, as well as devotional materials using the medium of art. Make sure you visit and subscribe. Pablo Picasso said, Art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. So take a moment to share this video because art is too important not to share. See you later, alligator.